Hey guys, welcome back, Schizone Series, episode 22. Topic today is going to be 3D rendering, in particular, parallel projection rendering of wireframe geometries onto a frame buffer that we can then view on the screen. Um, so pretty interesting stuff, but first I wanna apologize. In the previous video, I made some completely ridiculous comments about 9-11, that you know, the two planes didn't hit the towers, that's completely ridiculous. There's actually video evidence of the planes in the towers. It's not CGI. And honestly, when you have an event like this where 3,000 people lost their life, it's really insensitive to make comments that suggest that it's a conspiracy, right? So I made this 3D model. We can rotate, pan everything around, zoom in and out. And I put the planes, I put the towers. I also put the explosive charges that George Bush used to demolish the towers and motivate the war in the Middle East. And this file, if you look at it, is... Um, around 14K, that's 7K of instructions and 7K of vertex information to draw the models. Um, and so it's previously, it's pretty small of a file. There's no dependencies, no libraries, it's all from scratch. And we'll talk about some of the math required for this in today's video. And if you're curious, all the code is available in the suppository online. So take a look at that in the description. So with that out of the way, let's get back into the slide deck here. Parallel projections. So when it comes to rendering something, there are, I guess, probably at least two different ways you can render something. Our eyeballs are more of like a perspective projection. So we can see things that are further away. They tend to be smaller <laughs> in our eyesight than things that are closer. A parallel projection is not that. Basically, this preserves the size of things no matter how far away that they are. And the reason why most engineers use parallel projection is because when we design objects in CAD or in 3D space, we want to not have to reorient ourselves to, to the sizes of things when we spin the model around. And so usually engineers, when they get the CAD software for the first time, the first setting that they change will be the projection method and they'll turn off uh, perspective mode and put on parallel mode. At least in my experience, that's what people have been doing around me in my life, and that's what I also do. So it's very useful, and I think it's probably the most, both the better way to view things on a screen, and also, well, unless you're playing a video game or like making a movie or something, in which case, obviously, it has to look like we see things with our eyes. But if you're designing like buildings or structures or whatever, it's best to use a parallel projection for the render. And also it's just way easier math wise. Like you don't have to do all this fancy stuff. It's just literally like a couple multiplications and you're done. So the way it works is you basically have to define an axis system, call it your eyeball, where to the right of you, you can call that the X direction above you through your skull, that's the Y direction. And then the way I've drawn it here for a right hand system, Z would be backwards, but you're looking in the negative Z direction, essentially. And the way it works is you take an object, you project it in that Z direction onto your XY plane, and you put your eyeball at the middle of that plane, and you've essentially, then you can rasterize and draw your object like this. And so it's, it's very simple, actually, how this works. Um, but there's no, for wireframes, there's no uh, suggestion of how far something is from the camera because you, you don't have a perspective to use to get that kind of information intuitively. So you have to be able to say, well, I'm only looking at this this distance, this depth from the viewer. We won't cover that in this video, but um, you can imagine how that would work. And so I know for me, uh, particularly when I was younger and I was looking up how to render stuff to the screen in like OpenGL or whatever, or WebGL, um, it was always like, oh yeah, you have these world matrix and then a object matrix and a perspective matrix and this is where the viewer is and this is where the object is and you have to translate and rotate. It's just a bunch of nonsense to overly complicate the problem. Really, all you need is a, a view system and a model <laughs> and that's it. You can implement a parallel projection exclusively with like dot products. And so it's not as hard as it would seem, at least if you're using a parallel projection. If you have to do something with perspective, 
it might be more complex. Okay, so the way it works is, and I won't go over the detailed math on this because I think it's pretty straightforward and you could probably do a better job than I could at implementing it. But the way it works is basically, you have a point in space, call it point P, you have an origin where your eyeball is, call that O. Basically, you then just take the displacement of, of um, that from yourself and dot product that with your rightward and upward directions. That gives you components that you can then measure um, on your screen, you know, rightwards and upwards. Say this point, for example, up here. Um, that's like the first step, and that's the hardest step, step one and step two. Um, and then the third step would be just scaling it because there's no suggestion of how big things are. And so you may have to implement some kind of construction for how big something is, like how, how many pixels is my, my view, my pixel, like, you know what I mean? So you may have to figure out how much I want to scale this object, left, right, up, down, to, to render to the screen. So once you have that, um, the last thing is to rasterize that to pixels, and you're done. Only two caveats here. One would be to know that your screen has an aspect ratio, probably not one to one unless you have a very old <laughs> or specialized computer. Um, and so you have to implement something that zooms differently in the X and Y direction based off your computer's aspect ratio, very easy to do. And the last thing would be that you have to remember that your eyeball at the origin here is not the bottom left or the top right of your screen, it's the center. And so this green and red and blue intersect has to be at the W over two, H over two pixel on your screen in order for it to make sense. Okay, with that out of the way, some frequently asked questions. Um, so from that, you can see how to render a point. Well, how would you extend that? So how do you render a line? Well, simply, the frame buffer, the screen is just a bitmap. And we covered that in episode 12, how to draw a line. Basically, you just have to draw a line between two points that you've projected onto this uh, UX, UI plane. So you can do that already. It's very straightforward. It's just um, literally uh, plug and play with what we did in episode 12. How would you do a cube then? Uh, well, a cube, if you're ignoring the faces on the cube and just care about the wireframe, which is today's video, it would just be 12 lines. So just copy the first question 12 times. You now have a cube. Great. How would you do that? Well, what you'd have to do is you have to define eight points in space, right? And then you have to think, how am I going to project that onto the screen? We have a way to do that above. There's an algorithm here to do that. The question then is, you have eight points. What's next? Well, then you have to figure out what combination of those eight points for the cube are edges right not every point touches every other point on a cube you have to think well this point touches these three points etc etc and you have to draw the the lines of the edges of the cube uh, in that way question number four how would you do it if you had multiple cubes well um, a couple ways you could do that maybe you would just say let's add some more points and some more more uh, edges between them that would work or alternately um, you can say maybe have an array of like 10 cubes and you have a you know, pointer to all the different smaller arrays of points and edges, that might be an option. Or you could say, well, what if I have a linked list? That might also work. Many ideas for doing that. And last question would be, could I do instances and like rotate and translate each one? And could that also work? Yeah, that would be a good idea as well. That's it, that's the entire theory of the video. Not very math heavy. I wanna get in to show you the actual code because I think it makes more sense to see how it works in code because it's very hard for me to explain the code in these slides. So I have three examples here. One is a simple cube shown. Uh, I'll show that you know right now. Then we have uh, a more of a streamlined approach for rendering wireframes in 3D. So I have some functions to do that. I'll show you that. And then I have a scene, you already saw it, it was the 9-11 scene with multiple bodies. So I'll show you how that works as well. So if you want to see this, you can go to example 22 and you'll see three different examples, A, B, and C. So 
The first one is example 22a. Let's just uh, let's just run it first. You have to run this as a user that has access to both use the mouse and also so like the mouse device and the framework for device both have to be accessible to you. So I'm using sudo to do that. Um, if you have access to those files, that's fine as well. So you can see here I've got a cube. And to explain what I said before, um, a cube is just eight points. So eight vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm pointing with my Pepe cursor. Um, and there are 12 edges between various pairs of those vertices. So that's how this works. I can rotate the model. Um, I can zoom in and out with the middle mouse button. I can pan right, left, up, down. So I can kind of manipulate this model like I would in some kind of CAD software. Um, it's very familiar to me to do this. So that's the first example. I'll show you the next example um, first, which was example uh, B, just to show you what, what's, what's on, uh, on deck. In this case, I've drawn a different shape. I drew a cross here, changed the cross cursor. I'll show you why this is different in a bit, but you can see, I'm, again, I can rotate the model, zoom in and out, pan right, left, up, down. And again, I'll show you the example C just to keep it fresh in your mind about what we're working for here. Um, I have three different towers with 10 different explosive charges. Everything's a different color. I have two planes. I think each plane is like uh, 56 vertices and 90 some 93 or something edges so yeah I mean you can kind of see how you can go from a cube to much more complicated geometries um, and now I'll show you how that works in the actual code so example a how does this work well as before with frame buffer we have to have a heap so we have to be able to allocate memory dynamically, and so we have our own implementation of that. I won't describe that. Um, what do I have going on in the actual code? Let's see. Basically, I initialize the heap, the frame buffer, and the mouse, because all of those three things are being used. Um, then I uh, basically, so here's how it works. Um, I don't want to have to constantly recompute the, the rendering. Right? If I have to re-render the entire screen over and over and over again, whenever the mouse moves a single pixel, I have to redraw the entire you know, rendering. That's not really the best case scenario because if I move my mouse wildly around the screen, I'm just doing extra work for no reason. If, if the rendering hasn't changed, let's just not bother updating it. So I only want to update the model when the structure has been rotated or translated or zoomed in and out or whatever. I don't want to have to re-render the model unless it's moved in some way. What if, yeah, what if it's moving? What if it's a train on a train track? Then I would want to update the model, otherwise leave it the way it is. And so how I've done that here is basically, we have a, we have two separate buffers. One is the frame buffer, which is what we're drawing to the screen. And then I also have an intermediate buffer that just contains the, um, the rendering with no cursor on it. And so that's what this intermediate buffer is here that I'm saving the address at in R15, it's just a frame, a screen sized buffer of pixels that I'm going to render the screen, like the the scene to. And then on top of that, I'm gonna copy that into the frame buffer. And then on top of that frame buffer, I will then draw the cursor whenever the cursor moves. So that's kind of what's going on there. So what do I do? First I clear the screen, then I basically create my, my eyeball axis system. Let me go down and show you the different um, data first. So I have values for yaw, pitch, the sine and cosine values thereof. Um, so yeah, yaw, pitch. I have a tolerance for the rotation, um, sine and cosine. So when I'm rotating around something for the mouse movements, I need to be able to compute sine and cosine. And for that, we have a Taylor series expansion that we're going to need a tolerance for, which we implemented that in one of the first videos in this series. Then I have a scale for um, everything, for rotating, for panning, and for zooming. Um, I have an axis system here for the eyeball. You can see that U1, U2, U3. Um, and then I have a, a buffer to store the previous 
access system and why do I have that? Well, it's so I can basically, when I click the mouse to rotate the screen, I can save the old value of the view system here and update the new one here, essentially. So this way, if I click and I zoom right, or if I click and I rotate right, left, right, left, and go back to where I was, the model will go back to where it was. So it's not, it's not like um, course dependent of, of the mouse. It, it's a matter of where you clicked and where you unclicked. Then I have this perspective structure. This is actually what you pass into the rasterize function. I covered that rasterize function ever so briefly in a previous video. Basically, you have to pass in, here is your eyeball position. This is that O origin system that I described before. Look at is where you're looking. So there's a point in space that I'm looking at. Here I'm looking at 0, 0, 0 from point 1, 1, 0. That characterizes my Z direction, if you think about it. And then I have my up direction, um, which is 1, 1, negative 1, and my zoom value, which characterizes how big things are on the screen, in and out, is 0 0.3, just an arbitrary value um, for that. And so you can see I'm not passing in the x direction, the rightward direction. That can then be computed by a cross product later on. Right, the y direction cross with the z direction is the x direction, and so I don't have to waste time computing that or keeping track of that. Actually, I do, but not for, uh, not in this data structure. Um, and then here you can see what I was talking about for how to render a cube. So here I have what's called a, what I'm calling an edge structure that just contains a list of all the edges and their pairings. So you can kind of see. Um, the cube consists of eight points or vertices and 12 edges. And I have a pointer to the point array and a pointer to the edge array. So what's the point array? It's a list of the eight vertices of the cube. So I've got a, a unit two cube here where every side is, is two units long. And so vertex, you know, the first vertex, vertex zero would be at point negative one, negative one, negative one. And the last vertex would be at point one, one, one. That's the point array. So that's eight points. Each point is X, Y, Z, so three values. They're all doubles, so quad words. So you can compute that, how many bytes that is if you'd like. Um, then here I have the edges. So this edges is just pairs of vertices. So this basically means that the there's an edge between point zero and point one, also between point two and point three, point four and point five. And so you can see here I've described 12 different edges as combinations of I should say as pairs of vertices. And that is then passed into this edge structure, which is then passed alongside this perspective structure into the rasterized edge function, which I'll cover in a bit, that um, then actually draws things to the screen. And then lastly down here, I have Pepe the frog defined. I have defining some different colors for his skin and his shirt color and whatever else. So that's just defined here in space. This is the cursor basically that we've used to, for this particular example. So how does this work? Let's see. So I won't get into the, the fine details here, but basically I'm, I have to initialize those, that eyeball axis system. That's the first thing I have to do. And that's what I do here. I make sure it's normalized. I make sure everything's in, the, in its right, in its right location in both that view axis structure as well as the perspective structure. Um, then what I do, you can see here, the first thing is I actually call this rasterized edge function. What does that do? Well, that actually is what draws to the frame buffer our cube. So you can see we're passing in the frame buffer address. We're then passing in the color that I want to draw the cube. In this case, it's some kind of orange color. Then I have the frame buffer width and height. I also have the, um, I have basically addresses or pointers to the perspective structure, which is like, you know, the looking direction as well as the upward direction and the zooming value. And then I also pass in the pointer to the edge structure. Again, that contains everything having to do with the vertices and edges for the cube. Then I rasterize that with this function and then I flush to the screen. And now you can see right off the bat, I have the initial cube drawn to the screen. The initial cube being that you know, that unit two cube drawn in the perspective of whatever is defined in that perspective structure. So if I go, well, let me go down to the bottom. Whatever this structure is characterizing for our view of the cube is then in addition to 
that edge structure pass into the function, and then we can draw the cube to the screen. Simple enough. Then, um, I have some registers that I'm using here for the mouse position. So whenever I click, for example, if I hold the left mouse and click, the X value and the Y value of the initial click location of the mouse is saved in registers 12 and 13. And then I have a flag to see if we're, if we're dragging or not. Um, then I have a loop that goes forever. Basically, we pull the, frame, the, um, the mouse. We covered this in the last video. Um, and then based off the mouse being clicked or not, we can then do some manipulations uh, to the model. And so the way it works is if we're holding left click, we can rotate the model. If we're holding the middle click, we can zo zoom in and out. And if we're holding the right click, we can pan left and right or up down. Um, so how about left click? Well, this works simply by first things first is I'm grabbing the um, I'm basically computing how much we've turned about the look point. So if you think about it, when we rotate the model, what are we turning about? Well, the way I've set it up is that we rotate about that look point. So we have look from and look at. That look at is our center of rotation and we're spinning around that point in, in space. Uh, and so we have a yaw and a pitch to characterize based off how much our mouse has moved vertically or horizontally. So if we move um, vertically, that's a pitch. So if I've clicked that, you know, Y value seven, and then I drag my mouse to Y value 12, I have pitched down, I guess, looking more down on the model. Um, and similarly, if I move the mouse right or left while clicking, I will then rotate in a, in a yaw sense about the look at point. Then you can see here, I call cosine and sine, and that's for, for both the um, pitch and the yaw. So now I'm saving some trigonometric uh, computations for sine and cosine of those pitch and yaw values. And I save the results, you know, in memory here somewhere. So I have, I've moved those resulting sine and cosines into, you know, cosine pitch, sine pitch, cosine yaw and sine yaw somewhere in memory uh, in this file. Uh, then what I do is I basically manipulate the model to spin around to basically it, it's a rotation essentially about the look point. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm reconstructing the X and the Y directions based off our new rotation as well as the Z direction. And so everything has to get adjusted because we've now moved the model around. So X, Y, and Z are changed. And then lastly, I copy that new view system into that perspective structure and then Finally, we can re-render everything to the screen. So we jump down to this draw cube and that re-renders the cube to the screen behind the cursor. For right click, it's actually a little bit easier. All I'm doing is, again, I'm computing how much my mouse has moved with the right click depressed. And based on how much I've moved determines how much we've shifted in the UX or the UY direction. And you can see that's pretty straightforward. All we're doing is we're, we're basically adding to our look from and look at points. So I have a look at point and a look from point. If I pan up, I move both points down essentially. You know, you know what I mean, basically. We can move both points that define our looking direction up, down, left, right, based on how our mouse moved. Simple enough, not worth describing. And the zoom factor is even easier. So the way it works is with the middle mouse button or the scroll wheel clicked, if I move the mouse up, I zoom in. If I, move it, if I move the mouse down, it zooms out, I think. And so that's simple enough. I just change that zoom value in the perspective structure accordingly. And then lastly, in all three of those cases, if I use the left mouse, the right mouse, or the middle mouse, all that happens is I eventually do some math and then I call this draw cube. Well, I jump to this draw cube label and then I re-rasterize the cube and then jump back to the top. Um, what else happens here? Nothing really all that important. Um, I have some stuff like, you know, the first time we click or whatever. So think about it. Whenever you click first, you have to record, but first off where you clicked, but also what was the original configuration? So I clicked with this particular view access system. And I know I'm going to change that whenever I move my mouse, but I have to keep track of what it was before because I'm always comparing, I'm always going to be rotating that original system. If I move the mouse 10 pixels, 
That's a 10 pixel manipulation of the original system. Move to the mouse, 20 pixels, that's a 20 pixel manipulation. So no matter what, I need the original configuration saved somewhere in memory. Yada, 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 what else? Nothing else, really. The last step here is basically that I, I only render the background when I have to, and I only render the foreground when I have to. The background is the scene, and the foreground is the cursor. And so that's what this is doing here. I copy the background to the frame buffer, and then I copy the cursor on top of that, essentially. And then I draw to the screen. So again, let's just execute that one more time. Here's the cube. My mouse is here. It's Pepe the Frog. I can click and drag to rotate the model, and you can see all that's happening is the model is being spun in space. And no matter what I do, if I go back to where I was when I first clicked it, it goes back to the way it was. So. Yep, I can rotate the model with left mouse click, no problem. I can zoom in and out with the middle mouse button, so zoom in and out. And one cool thing that it's kind of interesting is the way I set it up, if I zoom out enough, everything flips upside down and the model is now inside out, which is kind of weird, but I guess it kind of makes sense because if I zoom enough, everything is scaled by a negative number at that point and yeah, so the whole model kind of gets turned inside out. And the last thing I want to show is the panning. So if I move the mouse, if I click the right button and move the mouse left, right, up, down, the model pans around. So yeah, and then you can do like combinations of those things. I can move the model in and out, zoom, scroll, pan, everything, everything, you know, will work in succession. Okay, cool. Example B. This one is way simpler. I'll show you how it looks. Um, in this case, it's pretty much the same setup, the same pretty much, but in this case, I'm only including functions. So this is all happening behind the scenes now. I've basically combined all that stuff into these two functions, frame buffer, 3D render init, and render loop. And so the first thing you do is you call this render init. Let's just show you here. Well, sorry. First thing you do here, I'm um, calling render init with a perspective structure and a linked list. In this case, it's going to be one entity, but you could have multiple for a scene. And uh, essentially, yeah, you just, I'm also passing in a cursor. So I pass in the perspective structure, which describes where I'm looking and how much I'm zooming and whatever. Then I pass in the actual object linked list. And then I pass in a pointer to the cursor function. So I could have a different cursor. Let's say I'm I'm making a program and I want the cursor to change. Like say if I'm uh, if I'm painting something in 3D space and I want to have a paintbrush, I can change that cursor here essentially. Um, and then I have a loop that runs forever that calls frame buffer 3D render loop. And so this there's actually no exit call in this program. It just loops forever. You can see loop and then jump loop. Um, so let's talk about the cursor first. So the cursor a function here I have to define the cursor. Basically, it's taking in these things. So frame buffer address, the color of, in, of interest here is yellow, um, and then the frame buffer size and the mouse position. This basically just draws a cross. It's two lines. It looks like a seven pixel uh, cross and 14 or 21, maybe it's 14 pixel across one pixel tall cross and then I'm also passing in the like you saw before the perspective structure and then lastly I'm passing in this linked list now here is how that whole cube thing that from the previous example starts to manifest in a more uh, interesting way and so again I have this edge structure for this cube in this, in this case it's actually a cross and so there's 24 vertices 36 edges, and down here you kind of can see different parts of the cross. I have the base of the cross, the bottom of the cross beam, top of the cross beam, everything here defined in terms of X, Y, Z position. Then I have some edge pairs for all the different edges of the cross rendering all the way down there. And basically those two things, edges and points, are then encoded in this edge structure. And then I have a linked list with only one entry um, of this geometry. And so I could have multiple crosses if I wanted, or multiple objects. I could put Christ on the cross if we want. Um, but here, the linked list next entity is null. And so that's how I 
that's how people usually describe that. It's the end of the linked list. If the next entity is null, the list is over. And so all it is is basically a pointer to the edge structure and then a color, the ARGB values of the wireframe that you want to draw to the screen. And so we can actually make the cross a different color if you want. We can make the cross blue. Let's do that. Um, ARGB. So that should be FF0000. Now we'll have a blue cross. I can save this file. I also should say, you can see where it says um, type of structure, so a DB and then a binary value. I'm not using that right now, but basically we can change that byte to describe, hey, this is a wireframe or wait, no, it's gonna be a point, it's gonna be a face, it's gonna be a, a whatever. I can change down the road. Um, I can use the same structure for multiple different types of renderings to the screen. Right now it only supports wireframes, but it in the future it will support other types of um, entities as well. Okay, very good. If I run this, here we have a blue cross. We just changed the RGB value so it makes sense. And again, the cursor is, itself, is itself a cross. So again, we can rotate the model all around, zoom in and out, um, pan right, left, up, down, and we can even zoom out infinitely and invert the cross inside out. So yeah, um, what do you expect? It's just way easier to do this now that we have functions that do everything, and all we have to do is pass in the underlying geometric data in the first place. Very cool, last example was the scene. And actually, this is even easier. Well, not easier, but it's it's easy now that you know how it works. And so, how does this work? It's the same exact thing. Actually, we don't even need to on that. We can get rid of this include, that's unused. Um, we have the same cross cursor as before. The same program, it's the exact same instructions as the previous example, 100% exactly the same instructions. The difference is we're only passing in different things. So different data, but same instructions. So in this case, we pass in the same cross cursor, I think the same perspective structure as well. But in this case, we're passing in a, a linked list that's not just a cross. And so here I have the North Tower geometry. So how does this look? Well, North, North Tower geometry contains um, both a pointer to the tower structure that contains the edge and the point information for the North Tower and the color of the North Tower, which is gray, I guess. But it also contains a pointer to the next geometry in the linked list, which is the South Tower. South Tower points to the third tower. Third Tower points to the explosive number one, explosive two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 charges of explosives. And then down here I have the geometry. So I have the plane geometry. Oh wait, where's the plane? I have a plane structure somewhere here. Right here, plane structure one, plane two structure down here. And then I have the points um, for everything. So I have the north tower points, south tower points, third tower points, tower edges. Here's the plane one points in space. You can see a lot of random numbers in here that took me a while to come up with. Um, plane two points here. And then I have the edges for the planes. And the cool thing is, if you think about it, even though there's two different planes, let me, let me draw it so you can see. Even though there's two discrete planes with different vertices in space, like this tail point and this tail point are not the same, and this wing tip and this wing tip are somewhere else in space, the same edge combinations are correct. Edge, so like edge one contains 0.7 and 0.9 no matter what plane you're on and so as long as the vertices are in the same position in the array the same edge structure is applicable to both planes uh, and similarly all the towers and all the explosives they're all just prisms and so both so any structure that you can see here that is a like a prism uses the same set of edges to, to define it we don't have to define another set of edges because it's all the same combinations of vertices. The vertices are different. The verts are in different spots. The points themselves are in different spots, but the edge combinations are the same. So yeah, pretty cool. This was fun to make, to be honest. I, I enjoyed this very much. This brings me back to when I was younger, this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, let's show you how, uh, how that looks in the code one last time. So I've got all the points defined, edges defined, and all those are encoded in these structures here. Um, so explosive six contains 
a pointer to the number of to the array of points for explosive six, but also for the tower edges because the tower edges and the explosive edges are both the same combination of uh, points essentially. Um, so yeah, that's how it works. You can change colors of things if you want to make. Here, let's make explosive three a different color. Let's make it instead of being red, let's make explosive three a green. Rerun this, and you can see explosive number three has now turned green. I don't know, I think it's pretty cool, right? If that interested you, check out our Discord. I'll put a link in the description. Um, if not, I'm surprised you watched this long on the video and it didn't interest you. Uh, I guess I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.